Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Why Egypt Matters, an important report back from Egypt's revolution, sponsored by the New York City Coalition to Defend the Egyptian Revolution and co-sponsored by the National Lawyers Guild International Committee. My name is Huda. I am a member of DER, Defend the Egyptian Revolution. We're all going to have to project our voices today. There is no sound microphone. Just <laughs> mic check. <laughs> OK, but if, if you, in case you can't hear me or the other speakers, just signal, and we'll try our best to project our voices. Before beginning tonight's panel, I just want to take a few minutes to begin by giving an overview of DER. Again, that's Defend the Egyptian Revolution, our group here in New York City, and our work thus far. Uh, we in DER began in, we began in November 2011, in the wake of the Maspero massacre um, in October 2000, 2011, and just on the eve of the parliamentary elections in Egypt shortly after, revolutionaries from Cairo issued an urgent call for solidarity to their comrades here in the United States. And it was under the slogan, Defend the Egyptian Revolution, End Military Trials for Civilians. Here in the New York metro area, a number of Egyptian expatriates and Egyptian Americans, mainly women, might I add, uh, decided to respond to this call by organizing demonstrations outside of the Egyptian consulate in New York to demand the end of military trials for civilians. Um, currently, there are over 12,000 civilians that have either been tried or are awaiting trial under military tribunals in Egypt. A few weeks after beginning our actions, the Battle of Mohammed Mahmoud Street took place, which many of you probably remember. And since Mubarak stepped down early last year, activists in Egypt, I think, knew full and well just what the counter-revolutionary agenda of SCAF was, how brutal and violent SCAF was. But I think that we here in the US turned a bit of a blind eye, or we weren't really paying much attention to it. But it was during that very crucial moment, back in November and December of 2011, that I think that counter-revolutionary agenda became full and clear. Um, and just seeing the, the sheer amount of detainment, murder, torture, and injuries inflicted onto Egyptians was really a wake-up call for us. And it was a wake-up call for us here in New York City to reinvigorate our efforts. Um, and to stand together and mobilize and defend the revolution because it was very seriously under attack. And simultaneously, we were also witnessing our own crackdown in this country. We were witnessing the very brutal and violent crackdown of the Occupy movement. So it was not very difficult to make those connections there between the crackdown of Occupy and the crackdown um, of, of the revolution in Egypt. And it was this critical moment that I think had us help see the interconnected nature of both as well as the US government's role in propagating both, in propagating both uh, the crackdown of Occupy as well as arming and funding the counter-revolution in Egypt. So we in DER continue to hold demonstrations outside of the consulate and outside of Point Lookout Capital, which is the largest shareholder in Combined Systems Incorporated, which is the American-Israeli manufacturer of tear gas that has been used against Egyptian civilians. This initial call to action that we responded to by our comrades in Cairo explicitly told us to, quote, take action targeting our government to end support for the military junta. And given this, we felt that it was imperative for us as activists living in the United States, living in the country that arms and funds the counter-revolution in Egypt to make this a core demand of our work. In December, we issued an urgent appeal to Occupy and all social justice movements in the United States to mobilize and defend the Egyptian revolution, in which we spelled out our four, four points of unity. Number one, we demand an end to military rule in Egypt. Number two, an end to military trials, murders, and torture of all civilians. Number three, the immediate release of all detainees and political prisoners. Number four, and end to US military and police aid and weapon sales to Egypt. Later in December, when the footage of a soldier stripping and beating an Egyptian woman in Tahrir Square went viral, myself and other founding members of DER issued a statement as Egyptian women in diaspora condemning the, the, the SCAF's gender violence and expressing solidarity with our courageous sisters in Tahrir and all over Egypt, who for years have been leading strikes, have been leading protests, have really been at the forefront of this revolution. And we also have been trying um, as much as we can to provide programming here in New York with a left analysis of what is happening in Egypt. Um, we have worked with Occupy Wall Street a, a great amount, specifically the Global Justice Working Group. Um, we have worked with Palestine solidarity groups. Um, we have worked with, with folks from all across uh, the spectrum. 
um, because this very much is an issue that I think connects all of us and connects our work. Um, Egypt really is, I think, at the, at the forefront of what all of us are doing, and our panelists will certainly speak more in depth about that later. We also organized several call-in campaigns to Tantawi, who is um, the head of the SCAF and Ganzuri's offices. Ganzuri is the prime minister, uh, demanding the release of political prisoners during this wave of SCAF's violence uh, this past winter. And uh, we also did this again during the most recent attack at the Ministry of Defense in April um, on protesters there. And I'm very happy to say that our call-in campaigns have had some success and they have played a they, they've played, I think, some role in helping to secure the release and press, uh, put pressure on SCAF to release at least two activists that we know of, Mustafa Nasr and Islam Kamil. Most recently, members of DER organized and participated in a National Lawyers Guild delegation to Egypt, which is what you'll be hearing about tonight. I want to conclude by saying in DER, our strength really does come from our work uh, and and us being rooted in so many different social justice struggles here in the US, be it Palestine solidarity, Occupy Wall Street, the labor movement, anti-war work, or defending the civil rights of Arabs or Muslims in the US. What happens to us here affects what happens in Egypt and vice versa. Egypt is not only playing a, a leading role in the revolutions across the Arab world, but also a leading role in the revolutions we see across the world. And it's these interconnected revolutions that are also championing the slogan of bread, freedom, and social justice. It's the revolution of the 99% against the global 1%. And we see it from Occupy here in New York to Oakland. We see it to the fight against neoliberalism in Spain and in Greece. And without a doubt, we see it to the decades-long movement for the full liberation, equality, and right of return for Palestine and the Palestinians. There is no doubt much confusion about why Egypt is important to us on the left, and there is a dire need for us to present an analysis on the struggle that continues on the ground. Tonight's event is not going to be an Egypt 101 event, so we're not going to go into the nitty gritty details about what caused the revolution, um, but what we are going to do is present an analysis and an honest assessment of where things are and where we should be going from here, here in the US. Um, and this event will have a strategic purpose on where we in the US should move forward from here. As people involved in different social justice struggles, we should draw parallels and we have a role to play. And without further ado, I will begin by introducing our panelists. Um, our first speaker will be Suzanne Adili. Suzanne is on the staff of the United Auto Workers Global Organizing Institute. She spent the summer of 2008 in Egypt working for the Arabic Network for Human Rights Information and she is also a longtime member of La Auda New York. Suzanne uh, also organized this delegation um, and was a participant on it as well. So please welcome Suzanne. Um, okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'll start by talking about um, how the delegation came to be. Um, I'm, I made three trips to Egypt this past um, this past year, um, starting in November in my capacity as a UAW uh, global organizer, uh, meeting ma mainly with, with uh, labor groups and, and workers. I returned uh, in January and in February along with uh, my comrades from New York, my allies from New York, uh, who work with uh, Vamos Unidos in the Bronx and uh, Drum in Queens. And um, we, we were there meeting with uh, various civil society organizations um, and uh, youth groups, um, more sort of uh, for the purpose of sort of studying what was taking place, studying you know, what we see as being um, a new revolutionary process and sort of starting to think about what that means, not just for the region, but what that means for us and what, and, and what we could learn from that process. Um, and at that time, I started to talk to progressive lawyers, veteran activists um, that, I've, that I've known about the possibility about, the, um, about whether or not that there was a need for such a delegation to happen. And, and the conclusion that there, there was, but not any particular type of delegation. This delegation was specifically focused on in addition to studying the revolutionary process, it was, it was specifically focused on investigating what has been and continues to be U.S. complicity in, in um, crimes 
committed by the military, by the state security apparatus, by the former Mubarak regime, et cetera. And in that investigation to also sort of look at how US corporations and other private corporations have also been complicit. Um, and with, within those crimes, we're also sort of not just looking at um, the kind of repression that we're always talking about that is committed by these counter-revolutionary forces, police forces, but also uh, what the economic situation in, in Egypt has been in, in the previous decades as a, um, as a result of liberalization policies that have very much sort of been, that the West has very much sort of been a, a catalyst for. Um, so I, I want to begin by um, then sort of giving you sort of a bit of, of my perspective on all, on all those fronts. Um, let me just add though that the, um, the purpose of the organization of, of the delegation was to investigate for the long-term purpose of coming back to the United States and working on three fronts. Um, using law as a tool, um, using litigation sort of as, as a tool, Num number one in, way in ways that can help sort of further the solidarity work that we do with, with Egypt. Uh, number two, um, targeting policy, um, specific policies that, are, that we now see um, coming in Congress or um, that will um, sort, of, sort of assist in um, trying to fight these, um, this, this relationship between US and Egypt and also um, challenging um, different policies that have been there that contributed to, has contributed to this relationship. But number three, and most importantly, we wanted for this to sort of be a fuel for a larger, more effective solidarity movement. Um, one that's, um, I'm going to contradict myself, but one that's not just merely about solidarity, but one where we can sort of like foresee us sort of working together in what many people I met in Egypt has referred to as a global revolution. Uh, very, and Egypt sort of very much sort of being at, at the heart of it. Um, I was actually uh, recently at the Socialism 2012 conference in, um, in, in Chicago, and I had the good fortune of uh, hearing a speaker from Greece um, who is part of the Greek Socialist Coalition, Syriza. Um, he spoke to us about um, the Greek movement and how it battled not just sort of a Greek elite, but actually a regional elite um, to come to a victory that basically was them losing elections only by 2.5%, sort of despite uh, the battle that they had to face. And he described, towards the end of his speech, he sort of described um, discussions that he would have with his allies and his comrades in terms of when, when things got difficult and they asked themselves, what is it that we have to do? And, his an and their answer was always, tahrir. And, um, and you know, that, you know, we always we hear we hear this, and, and it's 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 so beautiful and it's so important. But then it also sort of makes us want to stop and think, well, what well what does that mean? We we also sort of know and have heard numerous times that um, at least certain aspects of Occupy has been inspired by by Tahrir. And so when we say Tahrir, what exactly are we saying? And um, I'll begin by saying too that the Egyptian movement actually, the most militant parts of it weren't actually in Tahrir, they were actually in other parts of the country. Um, and so I sort of took a chance at kind of writing down what Tahrir means to me and, and, and start to sort of think about then, well, how do we sort of begin to sort of envision coming closer to that here? And, and this is sort of a working definition that we can all contribute to, but what it, I have seen it as is a consistent confrontation with the state and its forces, a constant confrontation with the oppressive economic system in a way that exposes and delegitimizes de that system, the core of its power being within the workers' movement, and added to that, a politicized, radicalized new generation of youth. Um, and so this is, this is sort of what I mean when I, when I say Tahrir, and that we need to learn from Tahrir and be just inspired by Tahrir. Um, at the same time, I don't want to picture a glamorous view of what's going on. It's a very difficult road. It's very unpredictable. Everyone's always saying you can, def you can explain what has occurred, but no one can tell you what's going to occur. Um, the situation now is very repressive. There is a massive counter-revolutionary force made up of military, police, and state security apparatus, um, specifically targeting protesters, workers, and the poor 
and in, in, in many ways much more repressive than we saw during the Mubarak era. At the same time, also politically within the movement, we had, there are a lot of reformist elements, um, and you know, there are a lot of political challenges. Coupled with that, you see sort of increasing exhaustion um, on the part of, of those who have been fighting you know, for almost, for, for years really, um, not, not just since uh, the uprising in 2011. You see bouts of depression. You know, you see it, 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 it is a very difficult road, um, but at the same time, there have been victories. Um, not, all, not all of which we know about here. There have, there have been victories, and sometimes those victories are just sort of the, the ability of people to come back onto the street and to sort of mobilize themselves. This recent election that brought um, a Muslim Brotherhood Party <clears throat> candidate Morsi to power and prevented the, re the election of Shafiq was a victory. Um, it was a very important victory. Um, what, um, we're not really sure. I have, I've been out of the New York for, too, for the States for too long to, 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 to know whether or not you, that's sort of something that we all agree on, but we can sort of discuss it later. Um, and so <clears throat> those are some of the things that we looked at. Um, but I'm just gonna talk specifically sort of what have been our, um, our, our general findings. Um, in, in, in regards to sort of what is taking place in, in, in the U.S. role. The U.S. government um, is, I'll just directly say, US, the U.S. government has been complicit in, in, in both the repression during the Mubarak era and the repression that we see now as a result of direct military and financial aid um, given to the Egyptian regime and um, through other sorts of economic relationships like US aid in Egypt and their, their support for other international financial institutions. American corporations are also complicit. Um, and even as the repression of revolutionary activists began to increase, corporations increased, in, in, in some instances, increased their sales of small arms, like lethal tear gas, which many of the people that who we met with sort of described to us um, just how lethal it was, how people died as a direct result of being exposed to that tear gas. We actually have um, a canister um, that we brought back um, from one of the civil society organizations that we met with. How much time is left? Okay, cool, because I, I don't know if I... Um, there, there are actually sort of many examples of this. Um, there's also sort of many examples of, of tear gas canisters that are unspent and um, you know, civil society groups, grassroots groups, um, sort of made it a point of, of, of you know, going after battles or doing battles and sort of collecting these um, and trying to sort of find a way that, to maybe um, study um, what, is, what is the current chemical makeup of, of some of the more lethal gas. Um, but they haven't been able to do that. Um, if somebody sort of has a strategy um, as how we can smuggle some of those canisters out of Egypt, talk, talk to me later. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit then also about uh, my experience with the, with the labor movement, um, talking to folks in the labor movement in Egypt and the importance of supporting the labor movement. Um, it was indeed the um, widespread and militant mobilization of a radicalized youth um, in, in prior to even the 2011 uprising that itself was inspired by a militant and organized workers' movement. Um, we, years prior to the uprising, uh, the Egyptian labor movement <clears throat> was constantly confronting their conditions against uh, their bosses, and also, and also sort of began to, to confront their conditions against the state. This is something that inspired youth organizations like a the April 6th Youth, who actually were given their name for their effort to mobilize in support of the Mahala strikers, who in April 6th um, had a very important momentous strike, which many sort of see as being, in, in many ways, the roots or the birthplace of what is now a, a revolution. And I wanted to um, talk just sort of a little bit about uh, the region as a whole and the revolutions that we see and 
how they sort of relate to uh, what we know of, of the past. And you know, the, the region has been part of a, a very sort of long anti-imperialist struggle. Something that many of us standing here in the room have been radicalized by, something that we've sort of um, grown up with. But then, as we start to see changes in economic policies, decades of, of, of neoliberal policies, liberalization policies, we start to see the emergence of an Arab elite, of a regional elite, not just an Arab elite, sorry, an Arab elite, and a regional elite, a, cap, a, a regional capitalist elite that is no longer just um, sort of doing the bidding of the imperialists, but also sort of becoming themselves an entity that have, has sort of been impress, oppressing these societies. And with these changes, we also start to see a lot of urbanization, changes in, in, in the economy. And we start to see a new um, class of individuals, very much young, very much unemployed, very much educated, sort of with sort of more of an ability to sort of with 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 a different sort of view uh, about sort of what is you know what is happening around them um, <clears throat> their experience is under these uh, changes economic changes liberalization policies under the privatization um, and the um, emergence of these of, of these states is sort of being more and more dependent on, on foreign aid, more and more dependent on, on, on imports. In fact, the Middle East region um, I read recently is the, the is the one region in the world that is most dependent on food imports, and Egypt actually sort of being the state that is most dependent on food imports. So all, all and 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 then we see also within this sort of. Um, Creation of a massive precarious workforce um, with, with, without job without job security. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to actually um, sort of give a quote um, from an article that I that I read um, in Socialist Review recently, describing sort of this sort of new population of youth. So um, it's um, from. And the author is basically sort of saying that, so that we find then communities in these urban areas in the region, and families, and within the same family there could be a peddler, a low-level public sector official, a factory worker, an unemployed graduate, all educated, all underpaid, and all under the age of 25. This close proximity of urban living means that they can influence and be influenced by each other. The growing power of the Arab working class makes it possible for it to lead the other poor classes because of its centrality to the, to the process of production. These circumstances, coupled by uh, the politi politicized radicalization of, 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 of these youth and these, and these workers, um, coming from their own experience, the experience of also sort of being brutalized by their state and for the, re the regional struggles of Palestine and Iraq that they have sort of been a part of have all sort of been the fact of factors in, 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 the, in these emerging movements. And so in Egypt, we see this struggle expressed in the very um, well-known and unified chant for bread, freedom, and social justice. But that's not just a chant. The demand for bread, freedom, and social justice was actually sort of put forth with real concrete demands for change. Uh, and, they, and they have from, from the beginning. And through their, these mobilizations and through the building of, of this revolutionary process, we start to sort of see many things exposed, including state violence in all its forms, patriarchy, torture, we start to see the real agenda of an Islamic bourgeoisie, and we um, that's when we start to see also sort of a, a, a significant break with the Muslim Brotherhood from among these youth populations. Um, and, and we see also that, you know, the experience of what is deemed to sort of be um, a very conservative force, like the Salafis, is, is, is actually coming from poverty itself. All, all of these sort of um, bring the issues this process brings the issues out in the open so that we see them for what they are and, and organize around them effectively. And what, it, what this process also exposes is sort of the extent of people's power, not just in Egypt, but also here. 
And <clears throat> the labor struggles that um, have been taking place in Egypt for over a decade now have, after the revolution, in fact, increased. Um, and every sector in labor has been involved. More sectors since the revolution began actually have starting to be involved. But at the same time, the truth is that the labor movement, as it confronts its bosses around issues like job security, um, getting permanent contracts, and increasing their wages, the labor movement still sort of continues to be removed from the political process. And, and the importance is to sort of bridge that um, so, that it, so that it could sort of um, move together to strengthen the, the revolutionary process. And one of the reasons why I think that that's the case is because of the increased repression of uh, the labor struggles, of strikes, of, of labor leaders. And so it's key that we think about how those of us um, who want to build solidarity with, with Egypt and other um, movements in the region can think about how to build solidarity, very good, how to build solidarity with labor struggles on the ground. Um, one of the efforts um, that we've sort of been talking about here uh, is this new project called uh, the U.S. MENA Labor Solidarity Network. And um, that's sort of meant to sort of be both an informational network and an activist network to work on campaigns that can specifically support labor struggles. Um, and that has actually um, turned out to sort of be significant so far, not just in us building sort of awareness over what has been taking place as far as labor in Egypt, but recently um, we were able to get a letter of solidarity from the, Egypt, the um, Independent Egyptian Fed Labor Federation um, with the Con Ed workers in New York who have been locked out uh, of, of their plants. The power of the Egyptian revolution lies in, in the mobilization of a politicized and radicalized urban youth population coupled with a strong and <clears throat> viable working class. And this is an element you know, that we cannot afford to take um, too lightly. Um, this is sort of the element that we need to sort of um, think about how we can support, um, not just through the MENA Labor Solidarity Network, but through the work that we do as a whole. Um, and I've got a minute left, but instead of continuing with other findings of the um, delegation, I'll just, we can just answer questions when discussion comes. Our next speaker is Behr Azmi. Behr is the legal director at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and he was also a delegate on the recent National Lawyers Guild delegation to Egypt. Please welcome Behr. I'm uh, at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and uh, Zan talked about uh, solidarity um, with Egyptians in, in the labor struggle, and I'm going to talk a little bit about solidarity in the area of, of human rights work. At the Center for Constitutional Rights for the past uh, 10 years, um, CCR has been, um, I think, at the forefront of challenges to U.S. executive practices like indefinite detention in Guantanamo, uh, the use of drone strikes, the entire sort of endless war paradigm that justifies so much of um, uh, human rights abuses and uh, uh, sort of vast executive power. Um, and um, that has for a lot, and, and we've also sort of uh, tried to um, uh, get accountability for um, US officials who've been engaged in torture and, and other kinds of uh, human rights abuses in US courts and international courts. And that struggle has been uh, enormously challenging for a number of reasons. I, you know, I think of a, can think of a, 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 uh, at least uh, two among many. Um, you know, what you have on the one hand, uh, really strong assertions of you know United States uh, Im imperialism and impunity, um, f uh, 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 f uh, just sort of a, a certainty that uh, military strength 
will provide a shield for accountability for human rights abuses, um, uh, even as we sort of condone uh, or condemn those human rights abuses, uh, similar or, or less severe accomplished by others. You know, on the one hand, and, and on the other hand, for a long time, complicity by Arab governments and Arab regimes, autocratic regimes in Egypt and Syria and, and Morocco, uh, who supported some of the worst excesses of the U.S. government in the war on terror. Um, Egypt and Syria and Morocco were uh, particularly preferred destinations of the United States to send, you know, terrorist suspects for rendition, for questioning in in the sort of torture dungeons, um, in in these regi regimes, and and these two sort of um, components coalesced very strongly, made it hard to to obtain, you know, sort of genuine transformation of the U.S. thinking, let alone Arab thinking, um, and I think that, you know there were a couple of moments where. Um, we or I personally thought there may be some some uh, hope for change. Uh, one, for example, was the election of President Obama, who, as we all know, promised uh, closure of Guantanamo and and an end to the worst excesses of the, the Bush administration practices. And in, he did this in particular, if you remember. Um, one of his first major speeches was in Cairo in January of 2009 where he again pledged to close Guantanamo within a year and turn the page on the worst excesses of the Bush administration uh, and uh, wars. Um, and uh, you know he did it in Cairo for an obvious reason. Places like Guantanamo and these executive practices held particularly sort of ugly and iconic significance in that part of the world. And and that audience, I think, was tired of being sort of preached to by uh, the United States in the area of human rights, as 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 long as the United States. Um, continue to practice human rights abuses at, at home. So I do think there was some, you know, at that time genuine hope that uh, uh, this individual, this president, would, would bring about some sort of a transformation in the dynamic between America and, and the, the Arab world. And, you know, you sometimes forget, I mean, Obama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, that seems like a million years ago, but I think it was in part, uh, you know, to sort of spur and encourage that kind of uh, courage, um, or what seemed like courage at the time. Um, so anyway, you know, that, that hope was, was obviously falsely laid three years and, and you know, and maybe naively uh, placed um, to, you know, sort of expect that, that this kind of change would happen by one person at the top was unrealistic, and sure enough, uh, three years later, uh, Guantanamo is still open, and and some of these sort of executive practices and, and militarism has really sort of been normalized in U.S. law. We have emergency laws like the you know um, NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, which authorizes indefinite detention. Guantanamo is still open. There's still a sort of the drone strikes have expanded dramatically based on a this um, notion that the the, the battlefield. Um, is uh, endless, uh, both in terms of duration and, and geography. Um, and uh, so, so that wasn't, you know, uh, particularly, uh, so that wasn't, you know, a source of genuine transformation. I think we now hope that there may be yet sort of another potential source of transformation, although it would certainly take a long time, and that's, um, you know, in Tahrir. Um, and you know, so much of the 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 movement in Egypt is, is of course, informed by uh, labor and other economic struggles, but also a struggle for human rights uh, and an end to, um, as Hoda mentioned, uh, military trials, militarism, uh, national security regimes, and and emergency laws in Egypt. And this is a really sort of powerful. Uh, a political dynamic and re rhetorical piece in, in, in Egypt. And so, you know, one thing we want to start uh, thinking about is, you know, how to sort of uh, build solidarity with people there uh, who are struggling to end these kinds of regimes, even as they're being kind of instantiated here in the United States more, more solidly. 
Um, and, and, you know, I'm, well, I mean, there's obvious cause for concern about the, the viability of the revolution and these sorts of um, uh, transformational moments um, and concern that the, you know, the counter-revolution and the military in particular will push back. Uh, but we're trying to start to think about ways, either through litigation or advocacy, um, we can expose the, support the, the uh, Egyptians in exposing the dangers of militarism, military trials, um, and also um, get support from Egyptian revolutionaries in exposing the hypocrisy of the United States in, in pursuing these policies uh, as, as well. And so, you know, we can talk more about what these strategies um, are like in the question and answer session. Um, uh, but, you know, they include potentially litigation in Egypt exposing the collaboration between U.S. officials and Egyptian officials and promulgating uh, torture, uh, torture there. Um, there was some hope before the parliament was disbanded. Um, there was a, um, in play a potentially robust freedom of information law being considered by the Human Rights Committee of the Egyptian Parliament, which might have provided opportunities to get from Egyptian government officials documents that would expo ex uh, expose U.S. and Egyptian complicity um, and embarrass the, 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 the current regime and the, the former military regime and continue to put pressure on, on each of those institutions. Um, and ultimately, you know, supporting uh, the uh, on the on the ground, supporting the work of uh, the revolution, um, whose uh, I think ultimate goal is getting rid of military rule as it currently stands, and a piece of that, as Suzanne suggested, is uh, endorsing um, and explaining why the the candidacy of um, uh, Mohammed Morsi is something to be. Uh, celebrated rather than feared uh, in this country, in part because of the dynamic that, you know, our work anyway narrowly is trying to end. Thanks. Our next speaker is Michael Letwin. Michael is the former president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, UAW Local 2325. He is also a longtime member of La Auda New York and Labor for Palestine. Please welcome Michael. Thank you. We are going to have a report from the delegation, which will go into some detail about the things that we're not able to reach tonight. And we also invite those who are interested in having reports from the delegation at other locations, let us know, and we will be happy to try to accommodate you, whether here in New York or elsewhere. But what I want to do in just a few minutes is expand a little bit or focus a little bit more on what Suzanne mentioned in terms of the interconnections between the movements in Egypt, the revolutionary movement, and the movements around the rest of the world, including, and for us, most importantly, in this country. Uh, it's worth emphasizing, if it hasn't already been, that it's our government that provides the Egyptian military with $1.5 billion a year in military so-called security aid. And it's those weapons, like the ones you saw, but also guns and tanks and everything else, that are used against the Egyptian revolution and that have caused thousands of people to be killed and, or maimed or tortured or all of the above in Egypt. This shouldn't be a surprise because the United States government happens to do that quite a number of places. In fact, it's hard to find many places that it doesn't do it when it gets a chance to. But in Egypt, since that's the focus of tonight, it's very important to keep that in the forefront of our mind. And when you put that together with the $3.5 billion a year that the same government, by the way, both Democratic and Republican, give to the apartheid Israeli regime, then you begin to see, along with the money it gives to the incredibly repressive and awful Saudi regime and the Bahraini regime and the Yemeni regime and all the other regimes, not only in that region but around the world, that our role becomes particularly clear. And so there are many reasons, obviously, to answer the question or ways to answer the question why Egypt matters. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. But that principle of solidarity reflects also the recognition that whether we are fighting against US wars, or against apartheid Israel, or against austerity at home, or against Islamophobia, or state repression, or the new Jim Crow, 
or all of the above, that as Suzanne mentioned, we of the 99% have the same interests and the same enemies in the 1%. And it's a global enemy. And it's, it's about global enemies and it's about global allies. And I'm sure that the locked out con ed workers are thinking quite hard about the 1% that they're facing and how they can't make it on their own unless they're supported. And that's true for all of our struggles. None of us can make it on our own. We all have a collective fate tied up with each other. And these connections and our collective fate is certainly clear through the lens of Egypt. Many of us know that the mass protests in Wisconsin, in this country, of Occupy, were inspired largely by Tahir. But there's much more to the, stro the story of the interconnections, the international interconnections with the Egyptian revolution than that. And I'm not even going to be able to mention what they all are. But I do want to quote a leading Egyptian revolutionary, Hossam El Hamalawi, who has explained it this way, quote, the Egyptian revolution, rather than coming out of the blue on 25th January 2001, is a result of a process that has been brewing over the previous decade, a chain reaction to the autumn 2000 protests in solidarity with the Palestinian Intifada. He's talking about Egyptian protests in solidarity with that movement. He also and others have referred to the fact that in March 2003, and this is part of what broke the fear about the regime in Egypt, 30,000 people in Cairo fought the police and took over Tahrir Square to protest the US invasion of Iraq. And as how Malawi puts it, quote, the scenes aired by Al Jazeera and other satellite networks of the Palestinian revolt or the US onslaught on Iraq inspired activists across Egypt to pull down the wall of fear brick by brick. These protests in turn, in support of Palestine, in support of the, or in opposition to the war in Iraq, in turn helped inspire a mass workers movement that Suzanne has alluded to later named, interestingly, the Mahala Intifada, to challenge the neoliberal policies of privatization and austerity that we're seeing all across the world, from Greece to Italy to, or to Spain to our own country. And, what, and that Mahala movement is what Hamalawi calls the dress rehearsal for the 2001 revolution. In 2010, mass anti-austerity protests in Europe and the Tunisian Revolution provided further inspiration for the Egyptian Revolution. Tahrir, in turn, has had an incalculable impact on all of the rest of us around the world. Due to its leading role, again described by Suzanne, in the region, it helped inspire an Arab Spring in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Jordan, and beyond. In, in a European summer in Spain, in Greece, and other countries, and for the first time, probably since the Portuguese Revolution of 1974, a radical mass workers movement haunting Europe, to coin the phrase, of which Greece today is perhaps the best example. And it's no exaggeration to say that without Egypt, there would have been no Wisconsin. There would have been perhaps no Occupy. The Palestinian Boycott National Committee put it this way last fall, quote, the Occupy Wall Street movement and its counterparts across the US, Europe, Latin America, and elsewhere are, at least partially, inspired by the Arab Spring for democracy and social justice. Leaders of the Arab popular revolt, revolts tell us that they, in turn, were largely inspired by our own decades own struggle against Israel's occupation of our land, its system of discrimination that matches the UN's definition of apartheid, and its denial of the right of Palestinian refugees to return home. In recent days, these interconnections have come first full circle, with young people in the West Bank taking heart for Egypt's revolution to challenge the corrupt and repressive US-Israeli-backed Palestinian Authority. So for all of these reasons and more, the fate of Egypt's revolution is critical for each and every one of us. And if only for that reason, although there are so many other reasons, we cannot afford to lose it to the tear gas, the bullets, and the tanks supplied by our own government. Thank you. Our next speaker um, is Ali Aisa. Ali is the national field organizer for the War Resisters League, and he is also a member of the Occupy Wall Street Global Justice Working Group. Please welcome Ali. Oh, thanks so much, Huda, and everybody for, for having me. Um, I actually was, was not on the delegation, but um, I was asked to speak because I'm part of um, 
a building campaign, an international campaign against the use of tear gas globally, as well as the militarization of police in the U.S. Um, that's very connected to some of the stories we heard earlier, but then also hopefully the later discussion we're going to have about global solidarity in general. Um, so but before I describe that campaign, let me read a brief quote from Karim Anara from the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, who says, this was probably an unprecedented act in terms of policing, in the history of policing. There have been instances in the past where tear gas was used excessively in South Korea and Northern Ireland, but what we had was a six-day continuous tear gas battle. Um, and then here's our friend Samah, who some of us know, a good friend of ours, and, and she writes, I was gassed with CS gas in Tahrir Square on November 23rd, 2011. Blindness, skin on fire, utter panic. Down with SCAF, down with the police state, justice for the martyrs of the revolution. So <clears throat> as many of you know, the, the tear gas battle that Karim referred to and that during which Samah was tear gassed um, happened on Mohammed Mahmoud Street in Cairo in the last week of November 2011. Um, in this particular battle, it's estimated between 7 and 21 protesters died directly from inhaling in tear gas and um, hundreds more were injured, some, some permanently. Um, also, as we saw with that um, example of a canister there, um, it's, it's, it's disappeared. To, to my left. Oh, here it is. Um, many canisters on the side said made in the USA. Um, the, that, that specifically meant they were made in a factory in Jamestown in western Pennsylvania um, and by Combined Systems Incorporated, which is one of the major tear gas producers in the US. So tear gas then, <clears throat> I think, is, is a very vivid example, um, a spectacular one of how U.S. military aid can be directly aimed at the Egyptian revolution um, and, and its forces. Um, but it's also something that just recently researching tear gas you find is, is literally used every day. And we have a Google Alerts going on and there's about four stories every day. This past week there's been tear gas used in Venezuela, Swaziland, Haiti, um, North Carolina, and Bahrain. Um, and that's just the ones that are reported. So. The, the fact that it was used in North Carolina, though, um, shows that it's, it's not just an international phenomenon. Um, it was used against Occupy Oakland, Occupy Seattle, Occupy Boulder, and just this past July 4th was a situation where there were a lot of teenagers hanging out in a park, and the Greensboro police decided to spread them out, arrest the three of them. Um, the vast majority were, of course, like black and brown. So it's something that really indicates how U.S. militarization is skyrocketing and how way before the Occupy movement there have been occupations of black and brown communities. So for all these reasons and more, the, the War Sisters League, for which I work, um, led by local international partners, is trying to focus on, on tear gas. Um, about tear gas itself, the nature of the weapon is very unique in that it sort of brings with it moments of empowered struggle that we can also like, immediately offer solidarity to so that the common weapon that many people are facing in, in, in Quebec, um, all around the world, can be traced to the same factory and then sometimes the same US or Chinese export license. Um, so it really kind of, I think, distills and, and then shows in a, in a really public fashion what things like US military aid mean. Um, but to go further into that, here I have a lovely comic um, which was produced with um, the Occupy Wall Street Global Justice Working Group. Anybody here from that working group want to like recognize yourselves? Maybe a little bit. Oh, thank you. Wave, everyone. And Ethan Heitner. And here we have um, examples of what military aid means. So here's Tantawi, or a representation of him, um, buying directly from uh, a military weapons producer, such as CSI, um, buying directly from the military, the Pentagon, or getting a loan from the Pentagon so that it can buy from those factories. So, like, discussing these weapons in specific terms allows us to get at how this functions, right? And also what the companies are. There's not just CSI, there's Defense Technologies in Wyoming, um, there's non-lethal technologies as well, which is often used in Bahrain. Um, so really getting at, like, the specifics of what we mean by military aid. Um, finally, Another really important reason to focus on um, um, tear gas is that it's a relatively small industry. Um, and the fact that people were saying uh, tanks and planes, of course, are also produced by the US <clears throat> and given to regimes around the world. But since the average profits for companies like Defense Technologies off of tear gas are around a million to three million dollars a year, which in war profiteering is actually nothing, it's, it's usually in the billions, it can actually be shifted, right? This is a big point of vulnerability. So 
The Bahrain uprising um, started in, in February of 2011. Um, the, the kind of gas and the ways it was used in Bahrain, like so copiously, brutally, um, was so um, outrageous, <clears throat> and the revolution there was was sticking um, to, to its positions, that actually U.S. tear gas is no longer used in Bahrain. Um, we, we have reports now that there's still tear gas, of course, but that's Brazilian tear gas. Um, and the rest of the military aid continues. But the fact that there was that shift, I think, shows that this is kind of a vulnerable zone and a way to open up larger discussions. Um, Another aspect is that this is not a new um, effort. Uh, in, in the late 70s, there was an attempt to ban tear gas internationally. It's actually banned now in laws of war, but not under policing, which is kind of an interesting, yeah, that yeah, deserves a laugh, laugh a little more. Um, but that also means that, that there's a lot of momentum to be built. I mean, 80 countries said, no, it should be banned. This is a chemical weapon. And then the, those efforts can be revived in many ways. Um, returning to Egypt as I close, um, it's important to note that not every week is Muhammad Mahmoud, right? I mean, it's not happening in the same way as in Palestine, where it's literally every other um, day that there's, there's um, an attack or, or sometimes a murder with tear gas. But it has still been used. I mean, Egypt is stockpiling tear gas. Um, the most recent example that I think Huda referred to was in front of the Ministry of Defense sit-in on May 4th. After the military had said that they're not going to use it anymore, they turned around and used it again. So it's, it's, I think in Egypt in particular, there's so much talk about military aid from our side as well as many others that tear gas is a way to focus that and actually achieve a very concrete victory. Right now we're in the story gathering phase of our campaign. We've actually been talking most recently to a lot of organizers in Greece um, who are excited to share that as well as um, in Seattle, in Oakland, um, in, in, in several other places, including Quebec. And if you have a tear gas experience you'd like to share, uh, we would love to put it on the internet so that you could be like Zechariah or Brad, represent Chicago, <laughs> or Anna in Copenhagen. Um, because collecting this testimony in compelling ways is really going to help us then push and link these struggles in, in, um, across the globe and, and target very specific companies, mostly based in the U.S. But also we actually had a, a story from Iran in 2009 because this is a way we can be in solidarity with struggles against regimes that are not directly U.S. aligned, but that claim to be anti-imperialist. So I think it really has that depth and I'd love to talk more about how it relates to efforts to build global solidarity, and especially what it means here in the U.S., where we're not necessarily having uprisings of that kind, but where things like stop and frisk, um, things like eviction defenses, which have been tear gassed, um, can, can really link our struggles very concretely. Long live the Egyptian Revolution. Thank you, Ali. Um, our final speaker is Lamis Deek. Lamise is the Vice President of the National Lawyers Guild New York Chapter. She's on the board of CARE New York. She's a civil constitutional and rights attorney and also a longtime member of Lauda New York and the U.S. Palestinian Community Network. And additionally, she was also a participant on this delegation. Please welcome Lamise. Um, I was told to wait for the changing of tapes. Has that transpired? Yeah, the tapes have been changed. I usually don't have a problem being loud, and microphones work to my disadvantage because then I'm jarringly loud, but I, I have a headache. So if I forget to be loud, just raise, I, I can see everybody back there, so just raise your arm, your hand, arm, whatever, and I'll know to speak a little louder. So I'm gonna take it back a little bit and kind of do a bit of a big perspective picture. I wanna go back to 1600, <laughs> actually, um, which is, the time around which the concept of the nation state came to be. And that's very important when we're looking at the Egyptian revolution and we're looking at the Arab world because the model of the nation state, as we're seeing um, through these uprisings and through these movements across the Arab world, the model of the nation state doesn't really define the relations between the people across the Arab world um, and its interest, uh, and when, especially not when the nation transcends the boundaries boundaries of the state itself. Um, and I think that's very relevant to keep in mind when you realize it's not a coincidence that across the Arab world, the uprisings happen to be at the same time against the same forces 
in the Arab world. And what we're seeing there is indeed a series of uprisings for democracy, but it's not confined to that. And I think that um, defining it as this movement for a democracy really distracts, detracts and distracts from the historic and actual context against which these uprisings are occurring. And it's a shame, I think most people have become immune to the terms colonialist, um, proxy colonial, neo colonial, um, or maybe even skeptic to it because we're so removed or we're not victims of it. We've victimized other people with it, but we haven't uh, experienced it. But it's really an accurate description of what this new round of revolutions is seeking to do, and that is to end the neo colonial, the proxy colonial um, tyrannies that they have suffered under dictators who look like them, um, but are serving foreign or private or elite um, interests. And looking at the Egyptian uh, revolution, um, where it began, how it unraveled, as a few people might have touched on here, really demonstrates that, right? So we turn to 2001, and this was by no means um, the, the, the very beginning of it, but certainly a relevant starting point, and that was the Palestinian Intifada. Right? You couldn't separate Palestine from the Egyptian people. You couldn't separate Palestine from the Tunisians or the Moroccans or even the Iraqis at the time. Right? So the movements began. Fast forward only two years, 2003, the Iraq War. Right? And you're able to see that the people are mobilizing more in mass. And the security, the state response, was becoming more openly um, hostile, more coordinatedly hostile. And they, um, the, the, the Mubarak regime engaged in mass deportation, prosecution, detention, torture in response to the protests against the Iraq War. And still, people came out in massive numbers. Right, So the nation state was not defi uh, defining the the identity of the Egyptian just as an Egyptian alone, right? So these people were willing to put, knowingly put their lives on the line. Again, to 2008, where you're also seeing an, an increase in the worker strike combined with this massive response to the war on Gaza, 2008, 2009, which really exposed the foreign nature. And I, I don't mean it foreign as an outsider, but the foreign nature as in the motivations being foreign to and not of the Egyptian people and the masses, the really uh, horrible response uh, exposed this, the response and the nature uh, of the, the, foreign, the foreign nature of the Mubarak military regime, where you actually saw um, the state security lining up at the mosques, waiting for people to come out to ensure that they weren't going to engage in a rally, where you saw the Egyptian military killing Egyptians who were trying to go into Gaza to stand and support the Palestinian people. Um, and then the Khalid Said. So the, the domestic and, and, and quote unquote international, not really inter international, occurrences um, help and the people's response to those occurrences exposed um, the Egypt, the Mubarak re regime exposed the military regime, and the greatest victory that came out of all of this, including the Egyptian revolution, but dating back from 2001 to now, to this very moment, is the, the greatest victory is a psychological victory. So throughout this period, people were overcoming this big stick of the security state. So it's in this context that we look at Egypt and see what role that we've played um, as you, you know people living in the United States and our complicity with the US government's role as a patron state for the Mubarak re regime and now for the SCAF regime. And by analyzing and understanding that, um, the, in understanding the US corporate interests and the US government interests, then we can gauge and be prepared for what happens in Egypt, but also what the US government has done and will do um, to Egypt and how that affects us and determines our role in the US uh, Egyptian dynamic. Looking again at the history of the military aid given to Egypt, and at the same time keeping in mind, we didn't get a chance to go into this in depth, that the military, the Egyptian military, owns approximately, and perhaps if not more than, 40% of the Egyptian economy. And this is something that's happened just over the past few decades. Um, and you consider that all of the military aid given from the US to the Egyptian military was um, all of it had conditions that were pre-approved by Israel, right? And 
Keep that in mind as you consider that the military aid and the military um, equipment that was given to Egypt from the US was second only to Israel, right? So um, Israel, the US, European, self-admitted in its inception to this day, colonial outpost, right? The same people who slipped at the beginning of the quote unquote Arab Spring, I don't like that term, the Arab revolutions and said, the biggest threat to us is really democracy in the Arab world, right? The fact that the relationship between the US and these what's been coined, and I love this term, deep state networks, these networks, mafioso networks between private elite businessmen and military um, personnel, staff, leaders, commanders, and their relationship with the United States government, the US government's role in this dynamic is classified, right? It's all secret. Considering that 2010 ballot dumping in Egypt was videotaped and public and everybody in the U.S. was still, well, well, the government in the U.S. was still willing to coddle and hold and support, still continue the funding. During the transitional period post-revolution or throughout the revolution, um, still direct military support from the U.S. government to SCAF, which was openly repressing, okay, and direct policy advice, and it's believed that the delay in the elections in the first instance were as a result of U U.S. government orders, right? A decade, at least, I mean, certainly much longer, of um, openly joint terrorism intelligence resource sharing between the U.S. government and the Egyptian government, the same terrorism coordination, you know, intelligence coordination that caused the Muslim Brotherhood um, members, leaders, even parliamentarians to be arrested, repressed, and imprisoned, right, who represent substantial um, portion of uh, Egyptian society, right, the same Muslim Brotherhood that in the United States is still designated as a foreign terrorist organization and sought to be targeted in the U.S. and abroad. And so it's no coincidence that we see this mutual, um, th this kind of mirror uh, image happening in terms of the national security definition, the national security policies, the security policies and their execution between the U.S. and Egypt. And even now it was, it was leaked that cabinet members after the election of Mursi um, were quite upset in, in secret, U.S. cabinet members were very upset in secret um, that Mursi had been elected and that they had planned to continue SCAF. But, you know, I think for most of you, that doesn't need to be articulated and, and people are aware. And the move of Egypt from being a broad welfare, you know, general broad welfare economy to a tightly defined military security petrol economy over the past few decades also quite similar to what we're experiencing here. So the threat of freedom, which was slipped or you know, averred to by the Israeli um, state, right? The threat of freedom boils down to the threat of the Arab peoples, the Egyptian peoples, the threat of their self-sufficiency and therefore their ability to be able to control their resources, to be able to benefit uh, from their resources as opposed to having those resources stolen and controlled either by the elites or by foreign interests, primarily U.S. interests. Um, and now in order to have sustained that level of repression, theft, confiscation, what had to happen was a great deal of um, oppressive policies, right? And turning to some of those, um, you know, and I, I, I'm recounting them for a very particular reason um, and, and I want you to listen and see what sounds familiar, right? So a lot of these policies of repression under Mubarak and now under the military regime, the anti-terrorism laws, right? Um, the, now we're seeing, in fact, and throughout the revolutionary period, we're seeing the expansion of the definition of terrorism, very similar to what we've seen in the U.S., the constant expansion of the definition of terrorism, the invocation of national security interests, not only to arrest people, but to confiscate land and to control land and factories, right? To expand private ownership uh, and conceal deals as part of national security, right? Like the deal to sell um, gas to the Israeli state at less than cost price, right? 
um, along with a plethora of other secret classified international agreements, including the 2004 agreement between the US, Israel, and Egypt, the terms of which remain secret and inaccessible to the people of Egypt. Um, the class, I'm sorry, the control, um, the control and governmental private legislation and policy making around telecommunication, wireless, um, internet, and media regulations, right? Um, and the, again, the classification of Egyptian US networks um, as being classified national security or oriented, the inability to publish even now information about the military without being prosecuted. All of this should sound very familiar to us here. Now, Egypt um, is, okay, Egypt because of its physical location, because of its role in the Arab world, because um, of the internet, uh, because of the canal, right? Um, because of the long history of culture um, that comes from Egypt, is really poised to shift and restructure the balance of power between people and the state. It's poised to redefine, perhaps even, what the state is and what the state means in the Arab world, to reshift the, the Egyptian economy from a, a military security petrol one back to one owned by the people, a broad welfare economy. And I don't mean welfare in the, you know, in the handout sense, you know, keeping in mind that Egypt was the breadbasket of the Arab world and now can't afford to feed its own people because of, of the, the reverse shift. Um, and it's also really poised you know, to, to be a leader in a very practical sense for us. Because if we look at the building of the Mubarak military regime and its unraveling, it crystallizes our con and reflects and foreshadows our condition in the United States. And so the policies that we just went through that were responsible for um, affecting and allowing this repression and the theft of the land and the theft of the economy to occur are almost verbatim the same policies that we are subject to. Now they might not have been executed in the same way, but they are being imported, exported between the US, not just Egypt and the US, throughout the, the world, certainly throughout the Arab world, and we are subject to them. In fact, just the other day, President Obama um, signed into legislation an act which authorizes or gives power to the executive, the executive being, being him, but the executive being the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, um, and those who execute the policies um, to control um, wireless telecommunication internet, right? So they can access everything, they can control everything, they can send messages on everything. And so we're moving quite rapidly, I think, toward our own military security state, and we knew, and, and this is us, right, the United States, the alleged so-called um, human rights barometer of the world, right? We're moving very quickly towards this military state. So who will be our next human rights barometer of the world? And Egypt is really poised to be in that position because if you look at what the people of Egypt are doing, aside from the big picture, the nitty gritty, I mean, it's quite amazing. Um, some of what they're doing that Bath had alluded to, um, you know, in, in the context the, with the overarching call being a demand for accountability and trials of all the people um, who not only engaged in the detention and the torture, but in the corruption and, and caused the Egypt, Egyptian economy to be devastated, right? Needed to call for transparency. They needed to know who was doing it, how it was being done, and how the country is being managed now. In the context of all of this being classified as national security and inaccessible, the call for transparency became really important. Now, it's relevant to us, too, because we want to know how our money is being spent in the United States, right? So if we can support their call for transparency, we're providing ourselves with information which we need to be able to participate in this so-called democracy. Um, I'm sorry, I'm almost done. Yeah? Okay. The, the application for freedom of information requests, right? The classification and reclassification of certain information. The constant demand for the people to have free access to airwaves and radio. I mean, this is really critical. Um, telecommunication, to have a role, to allow the people, to allow civil society to play a role in the telecommunication reform um, and telecommunication area. I mean, this, this is how people were able to communicate and keep it going. This demand for accountability, but none of this, you know, um, invalidating all the secrecy provisions, redefining 
national security, redefining these so-called terrorism laws. Um, yeah, the use of media has been really striking. The Kazibun campaign, which when the state media was really almost getting people to believe that um, you know, it, it, was, it was not the military that was causing the divisions between the people, the Kazibun were videotaping it and then blasting it all over Egypt. Um, so Egypt is really in, you know, it's in quite a quite a position. I just want to say, you know, lastly, I, I was supposed to touch on the um, the anti-Muslim Islamophobia movement. You know, certainly we know in the United States that's been the, the anti-Muslim uh, movement, the Islamophobia movement. I don't like that word. Um, you know, has been used to justify uh, not only wars but also domestic repression of activists against you know what are otherwise really repressive policies at home and, and abroad, right? And the terrorism laws and this anti-Muslim kind. Of of, uh, movement has been used to stop domestic dissent against foreign policies to implement foreign policies domestically and we've seen that transported I mean really imported parroted and proliferated in Egypt even internalized in Egypt for quite some time not only was it internalized but it was used to foment internal divisions to keep and justify the military being in power. And now we're seeing it being used, of course, against the Muslim Brotherhood um, you know, government. And, and it, it'll be interesting to see whether and how the US government will remove the Brotherhood from the foreign terrorist organization list, which means that if you want to interact with it, you know, anyway, I don't want to scare anybody. But, um, <laughs> But along those lines, looking, there was a Guardian article in which the, um, the British government stated, it was a few weeks ago, that with the Arab Spring, Al-Qaeda is certainly everywhere, right? Obama's dead and Al-Qaeda is, is suddenly everywhere. You know, and I think that that should foreshadow where things might go if the Muslim Brotherhood or whoever comes into power does not cooperate with the US government military security interests. Right? And that's something to be prepared for, right? Because if they lose the client state, if they lose that proxy colonial government, right, they're going to need another one. And they're certainly going to need another one who can balance um, you know, the Iraq, Iran, Shiite, you know, whatever threat that's happening. And I think we need to keep our eyes open for this. And I, I'm so sorry, I'm going over time. One minute. So I, I just want to say, you know, what we do for what we do in terms of supporting Egypt today is really directly for our own benefit. We have to keep in mind and we have to internalize and constantly be aware that internationally states governments are always coordinating they're always supporting each other and we have yet to really build as practical solid global people network as the governments have right and that's a massive challenge certainly looking toward our um, decline in the US, the decline of our rights, we need somebody who can voice some support for us and tell the American government to keep their hands off us. And I mean this very literally. Um, this is, I think, without exaggeration. Um, and and I, I think it's important for us to realize our power, you know, and, and this has all been a lot, you know, these revolutions came once the fear barrier was, was, was gone, right? Our power in the U.S., we are totally capable, even before um, Mustafa Nasser and, and Kamil, you know, a random group of us at the very beginning of the Egyptian revolution said, holy bejesus, you know, and we, you know, just a, literally, a, I swear, a handful of us were able to help secure the release of dozens, and this was within the first few weeks, dozens of the main leadership and activists in the Egyptian revolution. So we really have, if we can find creative ways that we're committed to, we really can produce practical benefits, solidarity, and support for the Egyptian revolution, certainly first starting at home and demanding our right to freedom of information to know how our money is being spent. And that transparency <laughs> will trickle over to Egypt, and then they can rebuild, restructure their society which would, could hopefully be a leader for us. So thank you.